Last night a story broke about IGN plagiarizing a smaller YouTuber's video review of Dead Cells and putting it up. Um, for those of you that don't know, plagiarism is basically copying word for word what somebody else has said, but passing it off as your own work. Um, this is nothing new to games journalism. This is nothing new to regular journalism. I'm just going to point that out, that plagiarism happens quite often in both of these, uh, these fields. Now, what made this one a bit different? is that the little guy was actually able to get word spread around that IGN had plagiarized his review. And this happened because he had a decent amount of subscribers. He had like 11,000 YouTube subscribers. And he had a Twitter following of I'm not sure exactly how much. But basically what ended up happening is other YouTubers picked up on it. People on Twitter started spreading it around. And it got to a point where IGN could not ignore it. As a result, IGN did their investigation. And as of uh, this evening, they have apparently fired the editor who plagiarized the review. So let's talk about plagiarism in game reviews. Well, not game reviews, but we'll say gaming journalism as a whole. It happens. It happens quite a lot. You would actually be very surprised at how often the bigger sites like GameSpot and IGN actually do this. However, most of the time, it's on small little throwaway news stories that they figure most people aren't going to read to begin with. Uh, it's about some small indie game, maybe it's just some obscure Japanese title, something like that, where, you know, the, they only expect maybe a hundred hits on this, this new story to begin with. Uh, case in point, uh, back when I worked for GamesAreFun.com, uh, which no longer exists, by the way, and this was, we're talking 15 years ago, easy. Uh, I had written a small story. I can't even remember what it was about at this point. And because the site no longer exists, it's not like I could even like go look up everything I wrote and find it. But I put it up somewhere between, say, 7 and 9 in the morning Easter before I went into work. And that's what we would do on the site is we would wake up. We would uh, hit gamesindustry.biz uh, and a couple other sites that would have like press releases stuff like that um and then write our news stories based off of those now i say write we did not plagiarize we just wrote the only times that we would ever copy paste anything would literally be a press release and you always knew it was a press release because it would always start with for immediate release um and that's exactly what a press release is. It's like, here's the, here's the thing. You can just throw it right up on your website. That's fine. So I wrote this small three, maybe four paragraph story. It took, you know, we'll say 10 minutes at maximum to write. And I went to work. And then later on when I came home, I was looking at GameSpot. And I saw a news article for something of the same title that I had uh, worked on, whatever the game thing, whatever game it was, I saw the, a news story about it. I'm like, oh, let me see what they wrap. And I go, and I look, and it's my exact article. All three, maybe four paragraphs, whatever it was, literally copied and pasted and put up on their site. Now, the difference between what happened then and what happened now uh, besides it not being a review and you know just being a small news story is that back then there was no YouTube back then there was no Twitter so it was our word against a big company's word word it was a small site with zero legal you know no no legal teams nothing like that against a site owned by CBS interactive who had a big legal team it was our article, which had no timestamp at the time, versus 
their article, which did at least have a timestamp of, I think, 9 in the morning Pacific. So all we could do was add timestamps to our articles after that. And we were East Coast based. So if we were to put up a news story um, at, say, 9 a.m. Eastern, even if GameSpot or IGN or Kotaku, which were all around at the time, were to copy and paste that exact article, their timestamps would be later than ours, even if it said the same time, because theirs would be for Pacific time, not Eastern. So there's a three-hour difference right there. So, like I said, when we're talking about plagiarism in gaming media, this is nothing new. However, this case was a little bit bigger because it wasn't just some small little throwaway news story of a couple paragraphs that nobody's going to care about anyway. This was a review. And it was a video review. And it was done by Boomstick Gaming for the game Dead Cells. And he had posted it about a week before IGN's went up. And then when IGN's went up, he had, I guess he was following the guy who put it up. And he noticed, wow, this is almost word for word what I said. And then, so last night he put up a video that showed the IGN video on one side, his video on the other. His is a week older. And yes, the IGN video, there were far too many similarities, I would say. There were some cases where it was word for word, definitely. But the overall flow of the video, the overall tone of the video, the overall wording of the video was far too close to not have been plagiarized. Um, and this blew up a little bit. Uh, and that's because he has a small but decent sized following on YouTube. At the time he had about 11,000 subscribers. He now has over 28,000 I think. And so other YouTubers picked up on the fact that he had been plagiarized. It also started spreading on Twitter because of the other YouTubers really finding out about it, especially bigger ones. And so as a result, IGN pulled their review, they uh, did their investigation, and they ended up firing the editor in question. Which is a good thing, because you cannot, especially as a big corporate you know, entity like that, you can't have your, your writers plagiarizing other people. But what if he had less subscribers? What if he was someone like, say, me, who has 200-ish subscribers? I'm literally nothing on YouTube, okay? Let's say that I had put up a review for anything. And I somehow got it up before IGN or GameSpot or whatever. And then IGN or GameSpot or whoever, you know, a much bigger site, just literally plagiarized my review and put it up as their own. Would that actually, would the same thing have happened? Probably not because I don't have the same reach of someone with, at the time, 11,000 subscribers. Okay, while 11,000 subscribers on YouTube is not a big number, there is a huge difference between someone like myself, who has 200-ish, I think I have like 220 subscribers at this point, uh, versus someone with 11,000. Someone with 11,000 is going to hit, get more hits than someone with 200 easily. Um, I don't have a ton of Twitter followers. I don't have a ton of YouTube subscribers. So even if I were to do the exact same thing and show, hey, here is the IGN or GameSpot or Kotaku or whatever versus mine that went up a week beforehand, it might not get any traction and nothing may have ever been done about it. So while this is a case of the little guy ending up being vindicated, I guess we can call it, uh, versus 
the big guy. This isn't always going to happen. Uh, there have been other people coming out and saying that IGN, in particular, has plagiarized their work in the past, but they didn't do anything about it, mostly because they're small, either small YouTubers or you know freelance writers, or they work for small gaming websites, and they just basically don't have the ability to fight it. And... So this is a rare case, we're going to say. This is a case where other people spread the information. And that is how this situation got to be as big as it currently is. You know, and we have to remember, especially back in, like, say, the late 1990s and the early 2000s when I was working for Games Are Fun. A lot of times, if you were a writer for one of these small press websites, which often couldn't pay you to write, you were hoping that some of the bigger sites, like IGN, like GameSpot, or even Kotaku, which still kind of sucked even back then, um, would notice you. And as a result, like even if those sites, like all, even if all three of them plagiarized you at the exact same time, you wouldn't say a damn word about it because you're still hoping to get noticed by them. Uh, you're still, you know, at that point you have ideas that maybe you could actually get into a job where you get paid to play and review video games and write about video games. Uh, nowadays, you know, being much older than I was at the time, yeah, I, I wouldn't do it, mostly because most of them are based in San Francisco, and it's an extremely expensive city to live in, and guess what? When you're an entry-level writer or editor, what, well, you're not even really considered an editor at most of these sites until you're writing reviews. You're just like a writer. They don't pay that much for the entry-level people, you know, and... It's definitely not enough to be able to move out to San Francisco and live in San Francisco and be able to eat and pay your rent on what they're going to pay you. Um, so when you're writing for these small sites, you're kind of hoping that these bigger sites are going to notice you, that they're going to maybe contact you or when you when they put out a, a hiring call that your resume may spark interest uh, that they see you've already been writing about games, blah, blah, blah. Now that I am, you know, 44 years old, no, no thank you. I am not doing that. I'll just do my little thing, deal with my barely any views on YouTube, and just do it because I like doing it. Um, and part of the problem would be, like, even if you were plagiarized back then, you didn't want to say anything because it would end up looking bad on you later on. Um, like, let's say they put out a, a hiring call and you sent in your resume. Well, someone who reads that resume right might remember that, oh, you claimed we plagiarized you at one point. And even if you were correct, they would toss your resume in the trash. Right there. Um, others who were already writing for the bigger game sites would not like you automatically because you've uh, claimed that one of their own uh, plagiarized you. These sorts of things, you know, you're basically burning a bridge before it's even built. And those are the sorts of things that you really wouldn't want to do, uh, you know, especially back in the 1990s and the early 2000s. Uh, even nowadays, you know, you get these people, they don't do anything if IGN or GameSpot or Kotaku or whoever plagiarizes them now because they just can't afford it if they still want to be able to try to get jobs at these places. And we have to remember that the, the gaming journalism scene is very incestuous, we'll say. Uh, nepotism goes far and wide in gaming journalism. It's not how well you write. It's not how well you edit videos. It's not how, you know, how much you know about games that will get you into one of these places as opposed to who you're friendly with. If you are, say, 
friends with Jeff Gertzman over at Giant Bomb and they put out a hiring call and you put in a resume, you're probably going to get that job over anyone else who doesn't know Jeff Gertzman. Okay? If you know Ryan McCafferty at IGN and they put out a hiring call, you are more likely to get that job because of Ryan McCafferty, not because of how well you write or anything else like that. Nepotism goes far and wide in gaming journalism. That's why you notice things like when someone leaves one site or one magazine, they're almost immediately picked up by another site or magazine, and they're always friends with who they know, or with people there, okay? Gaming journalists, especially at the big sites, they, they tend to form little cliques, and they are constantly talking to each other, all that stuff. They're friendly with each other, and they just move around from website to website. And there's nothing we can do about it. It's just how it is. Um, that's actually one of the reasons why YouTube is so nice uh, in that respect is, you know, there is a chance, not a very good one, but there is a chance that even a small timer could suddenly get much bigger than what they are. Um, really, that's about it, you know. I, would, I don't want people to think that this is a new occurrence in gaming journalism. It is not. It's a pretty constant <coughs> occurrence, and it's been a constant occurrence for well over 15 years. Okay? But again, most of the time, either the people who are being plagiarized don't say anything about it, or what is being plagiarized is so insignificant that it's not even worth trying to make it out to be anything bigger. So, you know, you're, you're going to see it. You might notice things. Uh, you hear about even on YouTube, like bigger YouTubers plagiarizing smaller YouTubers. It happens all the time. But again, the bigger YouTuber has a bigger fan base, has, you know, more influence. <coughs> the smaller guy isn't going to win. In the case that this was the smaller guy <coughs> winning, it's rare. It's good, but it's rare. And while I applaud Boomstick Gaming for coming out and saying it when he did, I can't expect everybody who's ever been plagiarized by a bigger site or a bigger YouTuber to be able to get this sort of recognition and actually get something done. It's going to keep happening. And it's unfortunately something we're going to have to live with. So, anyway, thank you for watching. And I will see you in the next video. Thank you for taking the time to watch my video. If you liked it, please hit the like button. If you didn't, hit the dislike button. Either way, I'm good. Also, if you enjoyed the video and wish to help support in making more, consider visiting my Patreon page located in the description below. And again, thank you very much.